So greetings, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for attending this next in the Caveon webinar series where we're going to present My Enemy, My Friend, How to Play Nicely with Infringing Websites to Help Improve the Test Security of Your Program. Next slide, please. I'm very pleased to introduce our two presenters. First is Caveon's own Carrie Straw. Kerry is a senior security analyst on our Web Patrol team. He's been with us for, I think, seven years. I know he's going to give a little bit of his background. He's going to be joined by one of our clients, Kathy Davis from CGFNS, the Foreign Nurses Certification Program. And not to steal either of their thunder, we'll uh, go to the next slide and just quickly overview. Kerry's uh, going to talk about relationships that you can build with different kinds of websites, friendly websites, websites where proxy services are being solicited, and, and the very cha uh, daunting challenges around international websites. And then Kathy will share her perspective with us. So without any further ado, here's Carrie. Thanks a lot, Steve. Um, welcome everybody, good morning, hope everyone's doing well. Uh, before I dive in, I'd like to share, as Steve said, a little bit of my background in test security. I've been a senior web patrol security analyst with Caveon for a little over seven years, and during that time, my sole focus, along with our teams, has been to identify and develop successful ways to uncover and eliminate infringing content for our clients, and that's kind of what I want to focus on today is a few of the most important and successful tools we use that you may not have uh, heard of or used before that you and your organization can successfully implement almost uh, immediately, hopefully. So as Steve kind of mentioned, what we'd like to cover in the presentation to reach those goals, uh, Skylar, could you go back one slide, please? Um, will consist of fostering and building relationships with site administrators and using those administrators, moderators, uh, students that are on the site as allies to become aware of content and help get it removed. Um, identifying what proxy sites are, shutting those proxy sites down, and dealing with the challenges that they present. Also, the challenges of removing infringing content from websites that originate in foreign countries. Uh, China is a, a large example of a, a huge problem in our industry. Then we'll take a break, as Steve said, have Kathy go over her methodologies and how it works for them, then I'll come back and we'll actually outline a specific plan that you can successfully implement. And then um, along the way, we'll have some opportunities for you guys to ask the questions that you might be formulating during our time together. Uh, so Skylar, next slide, please. As many of you are aware, the vastness of the internet grows exponentially with each passing day. And in 1969, the whole thing got started with the ARPANET. It was the first internet network. There were four sites and at most about a couple of hundred users, so not very much. And as we know, the landscape has drastically changed from then to now. Today, the number of indexed websites is over 50 billion. And during 2010, the number of things connected to the Internet exceeded the number of people on Earth. That's a huge, huge paradigm shift in the world prior to that. By 2020, there will be over 60 billion things, and they're all starting to talk to each other. So this problem is growing and getting more and more uh, difficult to overcome. Um, as a matter of fact, next slide, please. By 2015, there will be over a zettabyte of information available on the Internet. That's a one with 21 zeros. That's enough web pages that if you place them end to end, they would stretch from the Earth to Pluto and back 16 times. Now, if you look at only a billionth of 1% of that information, you still potentially have millions of sites that could contain your content in some form. So that's why enlisting as much help as possible, making this critical task easier um, is important, and why taking the time to foster relationships with website administrators is so important to the future security of your content. Next slide, please. So, how do you go about building these relationships? Before we examine some of the steps in detail, let me first take a quick look at our social landscape today. Every 20 minutes, next slide please, there are 10 million comments posted on Facebook. 
Now, this statistic doesn't include comments made on the thousands of other social networks out there. So you can imagine that your pool of potential points of infringed content is vast. Next slide, please. And also, the number of forums and discussion groups is in the millions, with content threads actually in the billions. So at this point, I'd like to take a minute for a poll question to get a lay of the land for those that are in attendance. So let me launch, let me launch, sorry. And uh, here's the first poll for Carrie. Do you have a complete list of sites that discuss your content? So if you see this on your screen, if you don't mind, we welcome your participation in this quick poll. And let's see. We've got about 72% of the attendees. We'll leave it open for just a moment longer. Okay, 80% have voted, and look at this, Carrie. 91% 91% uh, of the responses do not have a detailed list, and 9% do. Yeah, but that's, that's uh, about what I figured. Um, the, this is such a new area for most companies that they haven't had a chance to really build any infrastructure to handle this kind of problem. And the network is changing constantly. The sites popular today are going to be replaced with new and more exciting offerings. So things kind of need to be constantly cultivated and updated so you're not missing out. So what I want to do is get specific on ways to make an impact on forums um, and discussion groups and social networks and so that you can create raving fans of site administrators and forum members because forums and discussion groups, discussion groups can sometimes be tricky waters to navigate. Um, next slide, please. So first of all, site administrators have a fierce sense of identity. Nearly all of them believe that their forum is something special, and it's head and shoulders above similar competing forums. So you can use that to your advantage by playing to their egos. Next slide, please. Also. Clicks really abound in the social world. There's a, usually a core of members who seem to know one another. Uh, in jokes and even a distinct subculture unique to that form sometimes exist. And by following these conversations, you can get a lot of insights into how best become one of the elite in that form, and that's the key. Because once you're in like Flynn, your trust level on these sites raises exponentially, which means your allies will be more likely to help you in the future if your content appears on their site. Next slide, please. Forum respect is also not always earned as a result of your knowledge. Sometimes being a bit of a celebrity and tooting your own horn can really help you rise quickly in the rain. So any recognition you've received or are publicly known for will be really appealing to forum members and the administrators that run those forums. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, in this world, arguments and bitterness are rife. So no matter how polite or well moderated the discussions are, um, opinions as elsewhere in social media tend to be ultra polarized. Now this can really be a challenge to overcome, but you can be a huge um, benefit to these sites by having a calm presence and never escalating but helping to moderate discussions. It can really go a long way to building rapport with members and site admins because they see that you care about the quality of the discussion on their sites as much as they do. Next slide, please. Nevertheless, forums tend to be self-policing. Moderators attract respect and revulsion in equal quantities, but on the whole, there seem to be social norms that are tacitly accepted by most of the members. So members who step up and act as moderators in some circumstances can be some of the best allies uh, if you're having difficulty building a great relationship with the site administrator. So, Members will actually help you notify, help notify you of infringing content, even if the site admin won't, which really allows you to pursue other avenues to have the content removed. And without these allies, you may never have even known about it. Next slide, please. So once rapport has been built and you're running with the cool kids, most website admin and member allies trust that you have their backs 
and that you've done your due diligence and they'll alert you to or even remove content within minutes after receiving your takedown request and sometimes they'll do it even before you can get to it. Um, just to highlight that, here's a recent experience we have for a client that really drives this point home. Next slide, please. So during a test administration for one of our clients a while back, the site admin for the forum that had the largest infringement problem that we had to deal with personally closed down over 20 infringing threads and banned the associated user from the site before we even needed to act on them during a single administration. Now, we didn't have to address the issue. We didn't pay this person. We didn't offer them anything other than our time and participation in their forums, which wasn't a lot. But because of our relationship, the importance of protecting that client's content was understood by the site administrator. Next slide, please. Before we built the relationship with this administrator, we dealt with hundreds of infringing posts on this site and spent nearly 24 hours a day patrolling that forum. Now with their help, we've reduced the number of posts to less than 10 usually per administration period, all of which are almost immediately removed. That really eliminates the have, have the eliminates the chance to have that content spread across the internet. And our relationship has actually trickled down to other members of the forum now. So individual users know this site is not the place to share content. Yet the overall visits to the site have actually increased. And that makes the site admins happy too because their sites are still fully functioning and growing in some cases. So it's just one great example of relationship-based test security at its finest. Next slide, please. But this doesn't just work on forums and social networks. You can attempt to build a relationship with any website, even ones who've been a huge problem in the past, even those you've sent prior DMCA notices to and were ignored. The key is finding common ground and ways to help those people not feel threatened, but empowered, empowered to help keep your content safe. Now, I understand it's not always easy and it's not always successful, but the positive results will really surprise you. How much time, money, resources would you, you save by eliminating even one of your most problematic sites? And how much safer would you feel if that administrator became an ally, not an adversary? Next slide, please. As I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, the relationship building is ongoing, constantly changing as the tastes and preferences of the online community change. So all of the trends, Create new relationships as venues appear and eliminate ones as old ones die out. That will keep you on the cutting edge. Now we've covered a lot of ground here, so I'd like to take some time to answer any questions out there. Let's see. No questions so far, Carrie. So let's uh, let's keep forging ahead. <laughs> Excuse me. So I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to touch on another type of problem you may come across in your relationship building efforts, and I'll go into more specific steps in, in our plan for success part of the webinar. The problem is sites advertising on social networks and forums that offer your candidates uh, the opportunity to take the exams for them. Now this is also known as proxy test taking. They're known as proxy sites, candidate proxies. Um, they have quite a few names. Um, I'd like to see if any of you had to deal with this issue, so let's take a minute for another poll question. Next slide, please. Okay, Carrie, let me launch this for you. Here's the question. Are you aware of any websites that offer to have someone take your test for a fee? So two responses, yes, you're aware of some of them, and, and no, maybe you're not. Um, please take a moment and respond. We've got about 60% who have responded very quickly, and that number is increasing. So we'll give people a chance to click one of these answers. Closing in on 80%. All right, I'm going to close the poll, and this time I will share the results so everyone can see that 12% of the folks out there are aware of proxy test sites, and 88% haven't encountered them yet, Kerry. Uh, again, not, not surprised by these poll results at all. Um, uh, it's, it's 
it's an interesting problem. Uh, it can be a huge problem that uh, takes a lot of steps to solve also in the testing environment itself. Um, but the interesting part is these proxy sites usually aren't a huge problem outside of IT exams, but that's changing as well. Um, and every type of exam is potentially vulnerable to these attacks. So the question is what can you do when a company offers to take the exam, exam as a proxy for your test candidate? First of all, next slide please. Get to know the advertising lingo, the proxies and other test prep sites use to sell their wares so you can recognize it when you see it. That way you can catch these sites before your tests are actually compromised. Now a good way to begin learning the lingo is to become familiar with sites that have already contained proxy offers in the past. Um, next slide please. Some examples of proxy sites are no need to study.com and pass MCITP MSCE.com. In particular, the pass blah 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 MCSE.com site is an actual site dedicated to taking exams for other people. So most of these sites also tend to copy from one another. So it's a good idea to become familiar with those terms, the way they're set up and in your searches that you put together, um, add those into your search strings, the things on the site, and it will help you to understand how these sites um, exist and what they look like online. It's also a good idea to become familiar with freelance sites, homework and document creation sites, as well as forums and discussion groups where students discuss certifications and the job market, such as proprofs.com. Um, in the past, these sites have contained large repositories of infringing content for some of our other clients, and the time spent becoming a valued member of this type of site can be helpful in your security efforts. Next slide, please. As a matter of fact, just Monday, uh, one of our analysts was awarded a recognition badge on freelancer.com as an enforcer. Um, it's really kind of cool because it means over the last few years, we've built a reputation as a member who helps to keep the site clear of infringing content. And we're really proud of that unsolicited recognition because it proves that our efforts and our tools actually work. Next slide, please. I mentioned earlier that foreign markets can also be a large part of your test security problem, and yet they come from some of the most, uh, yet they can be some of the most difficult sites to shut down or to get your content removed from. And there's, next slide, please, a huge number of foreign social networks and forums that potentially contain problems. In China alone, there are thousands, and this graphic just shows a few. And as in our country, the social landscape changes constantly there as well. So what are a couple of ways to best gain entry to those sites? Next slide, please. One of the easiest ways is to have several international email addresses set up that originate from the country or countries you're concerned about and use those to create memberships on forums uh, that might be sharing your content because forum administrators in foreign countries are really, really leery about requests or posts originating from the U.S., especially if their forums discuss U.S. exams. As a matter of fact, in many countries, in China in particular, you can't even register to participate on sites, post comments, or download material without an email address originating in that country. Another great option to kind of combine those together, and it can really help, is to run a small subsidiary website from hosts based in those foreign countries that are a security concern for you. This gives you a local presence, helps you to build trust with site admins, and there are membership interviews for some of these sites to make sure that you are in country. Now, this is just a couple of tools, not an exhaustive list at all, but these two options have really made inroads into our clients' foreign sites much easier and more successful, and may help some of you as well. Next slide, please. So before we move on to our success plan, I want to take a minute and answer any questions, and then we'll turn some time over to uh, Kathy. Let's see. I, uh, I've got uh, a question here. So this is a question. How do I convince them that posting my content is bad, Terry? Or actually, um, I was trying to, how do I convince these sites that posting our content is not a good idea? Any thoughts on that or reactions? Um, usually, um, the sites that tend to be the largest problems, um, 
on the forums especially, are test prep sites that also um, have a large forum network. The interesting thing about that is these administrators sometimes don't understand that test security is very important to the, the exam itself. And you really just have to share your knowledge with your exam. Um, let them know that they are a valued part of um, you having a successful exam and for making their site successful. Um, that was kind of one of the biggest things we found uh, in that story that I was sharing was at first it was very difficult. Uh, we got pounded all the time by members that we were just trying to make this worse for everybody and not really helping the, the cause. But by participating in the discussion, sharing how um, we feel that um, they can be helpful to make the, the uh, exam successful, tended to, um, over time, uh, kind of create not as much animosity. The site administrator was actually the first one to come, o come along because he noticed that he was having a lot of people leave the site because we had first come on there. And so by kind of helping us out and talking us up, it brought a lot of people back. It brought in new members. And he also made sure that he posted a lot of information um, prior to any of the administrations that let people know that they were watching, that we were watching, and that they were serious about helping people, but also serious about protecting the exams. Okay, you know, that kind cool. of, I hope that gives you a little bit of insight. Yeah, and so there are a couple of other questions. Um, one is, you mentioned about setting up a local site in a foreign country, and I know you're going to touch on that later, so we'll hold off on that. And in the in interest of time, I think we need to uh, keep things moving along. So shall we progress? We, we, we won't, any questions that we don't address now, we'll hopefully address in the general Q&A. OK, so I guess I'll take over. Okay. I'm Dr. <laughs> Catherine Davis. And in the second part of this webinar, I'd like to talk about both internet and non-internet test security and fraud prevention from the point of view of CGFNS. It's an organization that gives a test both in the United States and abroad. So let me just tell you a little bit about CGFNS, and that way you'll have the context for our testing. CGFNS was created because so many recruiters were bringing nurses to this country in, back in the 70s, and these nurses were either not eligible for state licensure or couldn't pass the licensure examination. They were then often abandoned by the recruiter and didn't have the money to get back home because they had paid so much to get here. And so they would work, but they would work as nurses' aides, often performing registered nurse functions without the protection of licensure. So CGFNS was formed to evaluate their credentials, to make sure they were nurses, that they were who they say they were, and to give a test that would predict success on the US licensure exam, and to do this all before they left their home countries. So that test today is still part of two CGFNS assessment programs. Our certification program, which is recognized by many of the states as a prerequisite for licensure, and our visa screen program, which is a federally mandated screening program for healthcare professionals seeking an occupational visa. And CGFNS was named in the 1996 immigration law to conduct this federal screening. So our test is tied to state licensure and to getting an occupational visa to come to the United States. Next slide, please. Now, these two assessment programs do have common elements. I said we need to make sure that the nurses are who they say they are. We do a credentials review to ensure that their education is comparable to that of a US graduate, that their license is valid and it's unencumbered, that they are proficient in written and spoken English, and they know nursing. And so they have to take a test of nursing knowledge, and that is the CGFNS qualifying exam. Next slide, please. And we've administered over 500,000 over the course of 35 years. 
And where have we administered them and where do the nurses come from primarily? They primarily come from Asia. Top country is by far the Philippines, followed by India, Nigeria, Taiwan, and China. So the nurses taking our exam tend to come from these countries. And why do they come? Next slide, please. There are many factors, all kind of related to three categories, freedom, security, and opportunity. The factors that can push them from their home country are high unemployment, an unstable political environment, and factors that pull them to the United States in particular are their love of travel, better working conditions, and the pay. And the pay is really critical because so many send money back to their home countries in the form of remittances and the amount is significant. Uh, there was a New York Times article, I guess about five years ago now, that talked about the remittances that nurses send back to the Philippines, and this is from all countries, and five years ago that totaled $3 billion. So you can see that this is a significant factor. And that's why the test that we give is considered a high stakes exam and why we go to such great lengths to maintain its security. Next slide, please. So our qualifying exam is now internet-based. For over 30 years, um, it was paper and pencil. The last year and a half, almost two years now, it's been internet-based. It's 150 core items, 15 pre-test items, given during five-day testing windows four times a year because we didn't want uh, too much exposure of our items and it's predominantly a multiple choice examination. Next slide, please. So there are measures that we put into place before people even get to our test, and one of the biggest is the attestation that the applicants sign when they apply. And we wanted this to ensure that applicants know upfront that there is a penalty for test fraud that there, if there is unauthorized use of test materials, if they give or receive aid during the exam, or violate any kind of instructions, it's enough to expel them from the exam. But we also learn to make sure that they sign that they are aware that they should refuse any requests by third parties, either friends, recruiters, employers, test prep companies, to memorize questions or to give them details regarding the content of the test. And if they do so, then the test results will be voided. Um, so they do know up front that there will be problems. The other way that we maintain security is that we only allow primary source documents. The applicant is not allowed to submit his or her own documents. Transcripts come from the school, license validation from the regulatory body, and English language scores from the testing agency. Since we've been in business for about 35 years now, we have developed some significant databases, so we know what the seal should look like on a transcript. We know who should be signing the forms and what their signatures look like. We know how long education should be. We know if the diploma gives them the right to practice in their home countries or if they have to be formally trained. And we also know how often their license has to be renewed. Um, and we go through all of this because fraud is a very big problem in the international arena. Next slide, please. We also have security measures to prevent test fraud um, in place when we do exam development and assembly. And I think these measures are pretty common throughout. Uh, we certainly screen our subject matter experts. They are generally faculty. However, I will say we did find one case over the years of a person who was faculty but also worked part-time for a recruiter and thought that by writing test questions she would get some access to our exam. That wasn't the case. We did find out after the fact um, and we pulled her questions from the bank and certainly sent her a letter not inviting her back to write items. We have an exam committee that assembles the exam. They do have limited access to the bank when doing reviews, but they only get to see their own questions when reviewing, not the entire exam. Next slide, please. So here we have our last poll, 
and I want to launch this. The question is, uh, how are you currently administering most of your exams? Are they paper and pencil, GBT, or using internet-based testing? Um, so if you don't mind, please respond to one of these options. And again, we've got a flurry of people responding. Very interesting. Looks like the majority of folks are computer-based tests. A lot of paper and pencil, though. We're closing in on 8%, so we'll uh, close the poll in just a few seconds. Share the results, and looky there. All right. That is interesting. I was concerned that there wouldn't be any paper and pencil tests, but I'm glad to see that there are because a lot of my slides, some of my slides relate to that and security. Um, and that I guess most are computer-based or internet-based at this point in time. Next slide, please. When we administered our paper and pencil test, um, we really went to great lengths to maintain test security. And I wanted to share with you some of the measures that we put into place and some that still apply for our internet-based testing. And the first was site selection internationally, we always visited a site before opening it. We needed to make sure that there was easy access, but that it was secure. And for example, we used hotels quite often to deliver our exam, but they had to have a separate area kind of out of the main traffic, and there couldn't be any access to the test takers by family, friends, recruiters, and test prep companies. Shipping and customs presents a huge security risk. Um, we had to ship internationally six to eight weeks before the exam, so there was a great risk for exposure of our tests out there, and um, certainly had to try to mask the boxes so that customs officials wouldn't go through them. Um, we had our test center manager usually pick up the items, and in some cases even ship to the U.S. Embassy because it was the only way that we could maintain the security of the examination. We did have an instance when we got the boxes out of customs that a test booklet was missing. And so we voided the exam in that country. Actually, we, didn't, we ended up shipping a new set of exams through the embassy so that those in that country did not take the same as the rest of the people around the world. And transporting the exams from customs could also be challenging, as you'll see in some of my upcoming slides. Exam day procedures, identification. I know all of you asked for identification. We require one picture has, and one government-issued ID. And they, the picture has to be compared to that that is sent to the test site by CGFNS. Right now, because we only have 150, 165 question test, um, most don't take breaks. When it was paper and pencil, there was a session in the morning and in the afternoon, and anybody that needed a break was accompanied on that break. We allow no cell phones or any other electronic gadgets, no personal belongings, no books, no notepads. Um, and in some cases, at test centers, applicants were searched. Um, and I'm sure that wouldn't go over too well in the United States, but they did submit to that and emptied their pockets, etc. Next slide, please. I mentioned that arrival in the country could be challenging. On more than one occasion, we had to resort to some pretty drastic and expensive measures to ensure the safe arrival of our examination. And you can see here, in some instances, it went by armored guard. Next slide, please so that it could safely arrive at the test center manager's home. Next slide, please. And this is a very good example of how not to transport your examination internationally. Um, we did not allow test site managers to transport the exam on exam day using public transportation, and this is public transportation in the Philippines. Um, and I think the sign above is interesting. It's that of a test prep center, and they guarantee that they're going to pass, and they have a 100% pass rate for the CGFNS examination. 
which is a little concerning. Next slide, please. There are also some challenges in getting the exam to the center where it was going to be given and one of the main challenges was always traffic and you can see it could be a nightmare in any of the countries so those were some of the difficulties that we had. Next slide please. But the security challenges were not always related just to our test but also organizational infringement and you can see in this slide ICHP I mentioned our Visa Screen program, and that program, for that program, we created a division called the International Commission on Healthcare Professions, ICHP, and it administers our Visa Screen program. And I thought it was really interesting that we now, in the Philippines, have Immigration Consultancy Healthcare Professionals, ICHP, kind of just a way of drawing in applicants and also implying that there is a tie to CGFNS. Next slide, please. So what about breaches in security? Carrie talked about infringing websites and security breaches. Um, and we have found some other places um, for security breaches. We do have a crisis management plan in place. And since converting from paper to pencil to internet-based testing, that has become a work in progress. But I would like to say how we have found out that there are possible breaches and one of the ways is through applicant surveys. I had always wondered if they, our applicants were asked to memorize questions so that they could go back to the test prep company and so somebody said to me well why don't you just ask it and so we did. We asked on the survey if they used a review course and the name of it and were they ever asked to memorize questions and they answered yes um, quite frequently. And so we started to really pay attention to the test prep companies after that. We also found some test materials at local markets, bazaars, fairs, booksellers. Um, boss of mine came back from the Philippines to show me what she had purchased for $2.50. The $1.50 item that she purchased was a copy of our study guide, which was okay, kind of, but the dollar item was an actual test booklet and so um, you just don't know where your test is going to show up. Website, putting our content up is a problem. We do use Cavion for web patrol a week before and a week after and we have found a number of sites that imply that they are approved by CGFNS or have CGFNS tests. Thank goodness, most of the time it has been, the, the questions that are up there have been from our study materials. We have found on several occasions though that they are from the item bank and then they are removed. Um, we have not in the two years that we have been using this though found items from the current CGFNS examinations. And we have sent out cease and desist letters. Um, Cavion has done that for us when they have found breaches and, and also takedown letters and we have done the same throughout the year. Obviously we're not monitoring everything on a daily basis um, but we do monitor Facebook. We use LexisNexis to see if um, our exam comes up but we do recognize that there are many blogs and social media sites that we are not monitoring and we are trying to improve our monitoring of them. And most recently we started to find mobile apps that advertise CGFNS content, I guess. Um, and again, most of those have turned out to be study materials. Next slide. I would say from our point of view, our biggest nemesis are the recruiters and the test prep companies when we gave the exam in hotels we certainly recognized that they had a presence there. We barred them from the sites and that didn't really stop them because we, when we would visit, found that they were outside the test center, outside the hotel. They just moved across the street uh, but they certainly had banners visible so the applicants would know where to go to be debriefed. Um, we had a problem with applicants reconstructing items and passing them to 
test prep companies. Uh, and we have had a problem again with some of our content on the websites. So I would say I think that this quote from William Feather um, sums up a lot related to test security. And that is success seems to be largely a matter of hanging on after others have let go. We do know that our recruiters and test prep companies and internet sites are very, very persistent. And I think to be successful, we're just going to have to outlast them. Thank you, and I'll turn it back to Carrie. All right. Thanks so much, Catherine. Carrie, you want to uh, bring us on home here? <laughs> you got it, Steve. Um, I did want to touch on one thing. This, as a matter of fact, Skyler, if you could go back to Kathy's slide that showed the bus with the test prep sign right there. So where it says there, folks, that we guarantee you will pass 100% passing rate for CGF and S exam, you can put this term minus CGF, CGF and S, put your exam in there, and you will get a lot of sites hit for sites that are trying to sell or sharing your information. When I said these sites all advertise almost identically, it's true. And here it is in real life out in the middle of the street. So it, I, that just kind of hit me, and I thought that was kind of an interesting thing to point out. So, Skyler, thank you. And if you can go back to my next slide, that would be great. So, now that we've covered the importance and steps for building relationships um, and dealing with proxy sites and addressing international site differences, let's make sure that you actually have a plan to implement these tools in your organization and the steps in place to make sure that plan succeeds. So, first, research the top 10 locations online where your content is discussed uh, or shared, and hopefully not and immediately start monitoring those sites on a daily basis. On forums and discussion groups, take an active part in discussions and pay particular attention to which users are the most active and popular and who the moderators and administrators of those sites are. These are the people you need to get on your side and start building relationships with. Next slide, please. On a regular basis, and this kind of goes back to the previous question that we had about how do we get people on our side. On a regular basis, offer to share something, a retired actual exam question or some other type of valuable content for the site's use, um, and actively participate in the forum thread about that content that you're sharing. That's a great way to get people on your side to help them realize that you're not the enemy while still pointing out that your material is copyright protected, so they can't be sharing. <clears throat> so it's a nice, nice give and take. Uh, create an online resource page where your website has links to sites that have a relationship with you. And then offer those administrators a chance to drive traffic to their site by having a link on yours, but only if they abide by a zero tolerance content rule. That's another great way that we've done it in the past. Post often on sites and not just about your exam. Try to portray yourself and your company as interesting personalities, not the enemy. As I said, if you've got some celebrity, use it to your advantage. Let site administrators, I'm sorry, next slide please. Let site administrators know when your testing periods are so they can also be aware of times when infringements are more likely to occur. They may be more willing to help if they know how much of their time they're going to have to commit to the uh, task force. Also, assign at least one person in your organization, and preferably a team, to handle the online protection of your testing assets. Now, this can be a big job, and we know we do it as a full-time career. If the job's overwhelming or you don't have the internal resources, then consider hiring outside help, because this is such an important part of exam security. Also, organize a meeting when today if possible with your legal counsel to discuss details of what you consider infringement, share it throughout your company's hierarchy so that everyone knows where the line has been drawn. Companies have prevented many leaks by having employees and management know what constitutes infringement and how to avoid it and what high risk behaviors and areas reside within their organizations that may cause it. Next slide please. So, once you've determined what types of content sharing is considered crossing the line for your company, you then should determine what consequences are there for your test takers who cheat. 
big one. What format of takedown notification is your legal department comfortable with? And there's quite a few. Directly contacting the student, admin, whoever is sharing the content. That's probably the easiest, not necessarily the most successful, but that's why we have others. Sending a friendly bystander letter uh, can sometimes work as well. And if the initial letter doesn't work, a cease and desist legally recognized DMCA letter is the next step. After that, then it goes to your legal team. But whatever forms of notification your team decides on, make sure that your attorneys draft the letters and approve a DMCA template for it. With your legal counsel forewarned and on board, you can then send the DMCA or other letters immediately to minimize the exposure of your content and get what's been exposed removed as soon as possible. Next slide, please. To successfully deal with proxy and other infringing sites, you need to monitor where these types of sites advertise. And a good place, a good couple of places to start are freelancer.com and guru.com. Also, any of the other sites that offer to help with homework can be searched and monitored for offers from proxy sites or individuals. And you may just find general infringements not having anything to do with proxy sites on sites like, like these. Um, and um, these reach across all exams, across all types of content. So very good places to start to put a plan together for, your, for yourselves. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. Perform a human search of the site URL to find out who the owners and tech contacts are of, the, of the sites are and reach out to them if possible. And if you're armed with that info, you can then do a search for other sites owned by these individuals or companies that may also share your content. We came across uh, an uh, infringing site that had nearly 100 other subsidiary sites that were sharing the exact same content, all of it found by just finding out who were on the site and uh, doing a similar site search. Also, keep a running list of successful keywords, phrases, lingo, advertising, from all the stuff that you previously discovered in your searches from other infringements or proxy sites or any other content you might find. This list will really help you identify similar sites and may also help to uncover sources of other infringing content, such as brain dump and file sharing sites. As you can see, there's a lot of areas that you can go into with the same content and find lots of different uh, sites that might be sharing information. Next slide, please. We've mentioned about uh, creating a local presence in foreign countries. Um, where your exams given by giving uh, I'm sorry, by <laughs> using a local host, sorry, in those countries for a subsidiary website. And to create email addresses that originate in those countries to allow your organization to gain access to those forums and groups that will not allow memberships without a local email address or site. These foreign web hosting services are four of the best in China. Now, there's lots of others out there. You may have one that you already use or know about. And other countries as well, each individual location uh, should have its own local host services. These can be very great resources for you. So, next slide, please. To wrap this up, we've kind of come full circle. You now know the current state and vastness of the online social landscape and how it's growing exponentially. You've learned how to establish and nurture relationships with forum and social network site administrators, owners, and members, and how to recruit their help. We've shared insights into the world of proxy test taking, giving you tools to help with the difficulties of establishing relationships uh, on local and international sites, and wrapped it all up with a plan of action so that you and your organization can immediately be more successful in dealing with online social threats to your content. But none of these tools will ever be successful unless you solve the one problem that we as a team deal with more than any other in my years of test security experience, and that's delay. Clients delay. Delay costs time, delay costs money, delay causes your materials to spread immediately across the digital landscape unchecked. And it's true that the relationships we've discussed can help reduce delay, but ultimately, our clients have taken immediate and decisive action when a threat's uncovered and those who are continually vigilant even when a threat is not currently present because they know one can appear in an instant, are ultimately the programs with the highest level of exam security. 
and that's the real lesson to take away from our time today. Thanks for your time, and I'd like to open up the discussion if you have any final questions to ask. Gary, thanks so much. Such great lessons you've gained over the years shared in this session. A um, couple of things. Everybody, we'll show you in a moment. The slides and even a recording of this session will be available on our website. Uh, we're pushing at, I've got 54 past the hour. We always strive to keep these under an hour. There are a couple of questions. The first one that was, uh, Carrie, during your first piece, how do you develop a relationship with a site like Craigslist when you're just a small vendor? Um, sounds like this organization has done what Craigslist says it should do, but they're not having success having, uh, I, I would guess, proxies taken down, proxy solicitations. Any thoughts there, Carrie? Sure. Um, Craigslist is an interesting world. Um, it's not really social per se, um, but what you can do is deal with not just the owners of Craigslist and their tech department, but even the ISP um, to just apply pressure more than anything. Um, you can also flag on um, particular um, offerings uh, to have them remove. It's, it's really a matter of you have to be very vigilant. I mentioned that in the conclusion. Um, sometimes it takes us literally a year to get something taken down and help people understand. Sometimes it's instant. But um, um, Carrie, you just went really quiet on us. Can't hear you. Sorry, is that better? Much better. Great. And um, so, so I think that's good feedback, and perhaps we can share some things on our uh, LinkedIn group beyond that, because there are a couple of other questions, and we're really bumping up against the end of the hour. One more for Carrie, and then one for uh, Catherine. Carrie, really quick, what's a friendly bystander letter? When you're talking about the kinds of things in your toolkit to have content taken down? What's a friendly bystander letter? Basically, it's not a threatening letter saying that you've done this to us and we're going to sue your pants off if you don't take it down. It's basically what it sounds like. We are just noticing that you have some of our content potentially out there. Here's where it's located. And we really, really appreciate your help in having that taken down. It's going to help you, it's going to help us, and we really don't want to have to escalate it to another level. So a, a letter along those lines. Um, Great. So that, and, and, and so we're going to show Carrie's email address shortly, and any if you want further information along those lines. There are a couple of questions for uh, Catherine. Uh, Catherine, when you were talking about your breaches and some of the things you're doing, you talked about surveying your applicants. And one of the questions was, how did you actually do that? Uh, this person thought that the applicants would be hesitant to indicate that their trainer requested item memorization. Can you just expand on that a little bit, please? Well, yes, and I certainly didn't expect them to answer, um, but I thought I would give it a shot. And I think that it goes back to something I was thinking about while I was presenting and didn't really say. And that is that fraud in the United States may not be considered, what we would consider fraud in the United States, may not be considered fraud internationally, but may be seen more as helping your fellow man. Um, and that is what we heard from some other measures that we put into place, that the applicants were being told in the test review centers that the more that they could get more information they could get on the test questions that we gave, the more they would be helping the people that came behind them and helping them to see, succeed. And I think that's how they use it. And so I think the applicants answered the questions because they did not consider it to be fraud. And we are going to do that again. This was done uh, when we were doing the paper and pencil test, but I think um, I'm probably going to try it again. We give a survey after our internet base test 
pretty much asking them about the experience, but I think I'm going to try that question again to see what we get. Excellent. Hey, Skylar, can you go to the next slide, please? Just I want to make sure that people see. Um, well, do we have Catherine and uh, Carrie's email addresses on the very last slide? If we don't, that's okay. Um, we do have, yeah, we do have Kathy's, and we don't have Carrie's on there. We have mine, but Carrie's is carries the same format. So as long as you write in his name and change it to that caveat, on it's the same. I'll so, go to that now. so just we're up on the hour. Um, it's carry.straw at caveon.com. And on the previous slide, uh, you saw some of the places where uh, information will be available. Uh, under resources on caveon.com, you'll find the slides and the recording of this presentation. Um, and let's see, so I, we are now up on the hour. There was one last question that if people want to sit through, um, please feel free. Otherwise, we'll look forward to um, circling with you next month. Or actually, we're going to take December off. We'll look forward to seeing you in, when we pick up the webinar series in January. Catherine, this question for you is, you mentioned using LexisNexis to perform searches for content. What were you looking for there? Can you elaborate on the use of that research tool? We use it to, um, we, we have keywords that we enter into it to see what is out there being said about CGFNS. So obviously CGFNS is one of them. Our qualifying exam is another. And nursing is another. Um, just so that we, we're able to see what is going on. And what we have found, um, I guess from LexisNexis is, um, again, instances when people have reported to have our test content. And so um, we find articles written by some test prep companies. We have found advertisements from test prep companies. Uh, it's a fairly expensive tool, but it is one that we use for other purposes, and so we started to use it to see if we could okay. get some feedback on our examination. So it, it sounds like LexisNexis is yet another arrow in your quiver to cast as broad and deep a net as you can looking for compromised test content. Absolutely. Great. Hey, uh, I think that's it for the questions. I want to thank our two presenters, Catherine and Carrie. Terrific job. Such great content. Um, to our audience, thank you very much for holding fast for uh, the, the whole hour. Uh, if we don't come in contact with you later this month, we wish everyone a wonderful holiday season. And thanks very much for your participation today.